Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church. Amen. Well, it's good to see you. Very good to see you. And it's good to be together here in this place. And it's good that it's spring. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. It's been uh, quite a, a year. I uh, got a text message from my old college roommate in India, in Chennai, Reverend Sam, yesterday, and he told me that their church just opened up after being closed for a year. I thought, wow, how do you go a year and be a church, you know, without, but praise God, we're all, you know, this has been a wilderness for a lot of us this last year plus. It's been kind of a wilderness. There's been amazing good spots in it, and there's been some really hard things to deal with in it, too. And so I thought today, uh, I had something else planned altogether to share about that uh, I thought, actually, we should replay Ted's from last week. <laughs> Didn't he do a great job? <laughs> But the more I thought and prayed about it, I thought, there's Wilderness Survival 101, <laughs> surviving in the wilderness. And so that's what we're going to be sharing about here today. And Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, says this, a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. You know, uh, we don't live in the Holy Land, and what we think of a wilderness is a little bit different than what a wilderness is there. When uh, at times in the past when we have flown to visit my wife's family in Oregon, we've flown over the Canadian Rockies, and you look down and you see something. This isn't what you see from the air, but this is the idea that we have of a wilderness. There's tremendous amount of trees and, you know, just everything is like that. And, you know, it's so interesting when you're flying like that and you look down over the Rockies and you look at all these mountains in the middle of what we would call nowhere. I just think when I see that, like, you know, that we're probably looking at places where no human foot has ever stepped up in these beautiful wilderness areas. Our, our wildernesses we have are filled with game and food, and I mean, you have to hunt it, you have to find it, but when we think of a wilderness, more often than not, that's what we're thinking of. When Israel thinks of a wilderness... <laughs> <laughs> it's a little different. <laughs> uh, there's little places where you can graze some animals if, you're, if you have them and you're out there. But, you know, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. In this wilderness, as in the other one, there's no way of knowing where you're headed. And that's part of what makes it a wilderness. I mean, there aren't like street signs. There aren't roads. There's no way to show you where you're going and how you're going to get there. You're out in this wilderness and you don't know how long it's going to last. And then you just feel so alone. And Numbers chapter 20, uh, I love this uh, scripture here. How many of you have felt like you've been in a wilderness? Let's start with that. I feel like I've been in a wilderness, at least throughout 
big chunks of this past year. So Numbers chapter 20, beginning with verse 4. Um, let's see here. I'm going the wrong way. The wilderness is a wretched place. How about that? That's a scriptural term. Numbers 20, verse 4. Why then have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our beasts to die here? Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? It's not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there water to drink. Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to them. They, Israel complained to Moses after seeing all the miracles that they saw in their deliverance from Egypt about this wilderness. It's a, a wretched place. Wretched is bad quality, sad, miserable, distressed, Harsh, loathsome, contemptible. At times over this last year, we've probably all felt, at least throughout parts of the time, like it's been a wretched place. We're just not used to living and the circumstances in which we've lived, and we're not used to the losses that we've received in our relationships as this thing has run its course in our lives. It seems like a wretched place. Deuteronomy has a different description for a wilderness. It's a terrible place. <laughs> Hasn't it been terrible at times throughout this season that we've been, not all the time, thank God, but at times it's just been terrible. Deuteronomy 8.15, he led you through the great and terrible wilderness with his fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought out water for you out of the rock of Flint. The great and terrible. Great in this sense doesn't mean like, oh, it's great. It just means expansive. It's extensive and terrible. If we think about the meanings of that, we uh, think about this distressing, appalling, extremely disagreeable, horrible. At times throughout this year, that's been our experience. Not all the time, thank God. There's times we've seen God clearly and times that he's done some wonderful things. And when you, we look back, even during the terrible times, there, his faithfulness really is there. It's just we don't always see it there. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Oh, there you are. You, know, you, you are here. You're just, I, I didn't see you because I'm looking ahead. I'm looking at something else. But his faithfulness, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. That wilderness, it's, it's a place that is beyond the limits of settlement. It's disorderly, dangerous, wild, and sparsely inhabited, unfit for permanent settlement. How about that? A wilderness experience is usually thought of as a tough time in which believers endure discomfort and trials, the pleasant things of life are unable to be enjoyed or they may be absent altogether. A wilderness experience is where you feel a great lack of encouragement. How many of us have been there during this year? Some of us are still there. You know, through all the things that, that have happened in our home, yeah, I, I still feel at times like I'm in a wilderness, and I'm, I don't know how to get out of it. And that's part of the whole thing about a wilderness. It, there aren't landmarks. There aren't, there's not a road. And, and that's why God says, you know, make a highway in the wilderness. Travel. So the wilderness is a place of humbling and testing to reveal what's in our hearts. Ouch. I don't like what was in my heart the whole time during this last year where we've been dealing with this pandemic. At times in this last year, I've faced depression. At times in this last year, I've faced 
discouragement. At, at times in this last year, I've faced fear. At times in this last year, I've faced stress. I'm just being honest. And these things that have, have come upon us, it, it's a place where I have to humble myself and God tests me to, to show what's in my heart. Will, he, will we keep his commandments? Deuteronomy 8, 2. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. You know, my daughter still has tremendous problems relating from COVID. She had tremendous co problems before COVID. She has more tremendous problems. I mean, she lived amazingly. Her hand is paralyzed. It's blue. There are still things that create a wilderness environment that we have to find God's way through. And you do too, in your circumstances, in your situation. There's times that I just have to humble myself and say, Lord, you, you say in your word, trust in you with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding. In all my ways, acknowledge you and you shall bring it to pass. I, I don't understand all the things that have taken place in some of your lives, in my life, in, in the life of our congregation. But you know what? You come to the point where you don't have to understand. You just have to trust. God, in this universe, you're in charge. In God, in this, in this life, you're in charge. In my home, you are in charge. In our thing, in Jennifer's life, Lord, you are God over all. And even though we don't understand this and we don't like it and we never would want to have seen it happen, you're still God. You're still in charge. And Father, I just, in childlike faith, I don't have to have all the answers. I'm just going to trust you. And I think that's part of the posture that we have to have in our lives. It's, the wilderness is a place of wandering if we don't obey. They, they say that the wilderness could have been crossed in, what, 14 days? It took them 40 years 40 years to get through because they just wandered. Numbers 14, 1 through 4, all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and little ones will become plunder wouldn't it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and return to Egypt. They wanted to go back because of the challenges they faced in the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of temptation and of victory. And we don't have to look further than the life of Jesus to see that. We're tempted with attitudes and thoughts and actions when we're in a wilderness that we're not tempted with when things are going really well and, and things are as we wish they would be. As much as I know the Bible, and I've been living it as best I know how for over 40 years, I'm still tempted To be angry, to be depressed. I'm tempted with those things in my wilderness. And yet I know in my mind and I know from the word of God that that's not the place that we're to live. And I have to face those temptations. And Jesus faced those temptations in different ways. The wilderness is a place of temptation. You know, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, and the devil tempted him. You think the devil has nerve? <laughs> you know, I mean, 
Jesus could have just said, evaporate. You know? <laughs> When we lived in England, one of our church members was talking about the devil one time. Sundar and Lydia, you, you'll get a kick out of this. He's a cheeky fellow. <laughs> they, it's a place of temptation. Jesus came back when he was tempted with the word of God. Command that these stones become bread. He answered, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He came back with scripture after scripture. And, you know, one of the temptations when you're in a wilderness is to neglect the word of God because you're low and you're not feeling like it. Well, that's a time to, to redouble the commitment to being in the Word of God. And sometimes I just put it on my phone. I've got my Bible audio. I just put it on and just listen and listen and listen. Other times I read. But it's a place of temptation when you're in a wilderness. But it's also a place of victory. And Jesus had the victory. Amen. And we can too. I want to tell you, it's much better to have the victory than it is to be in defeat. I've been both, and you've been both too. How many of you know it's much better to be in victory than it is to be in defeat? Amen. But sometimes it takes a little walking it through to come to the place <laughs> where, where we get to that place of, of uh, victory. The wilderness is a place of meeting with God and receiving direction. Where was it that Moses had the burning bush experience? It was in a wilderness, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked. The, behold, the bush was burning with fire. And we know the story. God gave an encounter to Moses in the wilderness. Now, Moses was in a wilderness, uh, not only literally in a wilderness, but he was in a, a spiritual kind of a wilderness that essentially was his own making. He sought to do the will of God by murdering an Egyptian and burying him in the sand. And he thought that his whole nation would recognize that he was God's chosen deliverer. Well, they didn't. And he fled for his life, and that's why he was out in the wilderness. And there, you know, the wilderness is a place where you learn that God is a God of a second chance. And Moses was out there. He'd completely given up any idea, raised in Pharaoh's household, learned in all the learning of the Egyptians, a man powerful in word and action, according to the book of Acts ran away for his life because he messed up royally. Oh, really, literally royally, he messed up. <laughs> he was a prince of Egypt. <laughs> I'm going to have to remember that one. That's a good <laughs> you want to talk about a royal mess up? <laughs> it's not Charles. <laughs> it's, it's Moses, praise the Lord. But out... In that wilderness, driven from his life of royalty, everything he had known, a bush burns. And I want to tell you, if you're in a wilderness, don't neglect prayer. No matter how you're feeling, if you're feeling like praying or if you're feeling like anything but praying, pray. And open those communions with the Lord. Because he may just come and let a burning bush take place in your life. We came back from Europe thinking that our time in the ministry was done and we wouldn't see it again. But I heard somebody say one time, when you miss a flight in the airport, you don't 
moan and cry and wail hopelessly. You get on the next flight. (laughs) And the difference is the timing's a little different of your arrival and you're with a different group of people. But you're going to get to your destination. And when I heard that, that was so liberating to me that God, it's not like we needed a second chance because it, it was sickness that hit our home and we had no choice but to leave. But in a way, it was a second chance because we had come out of the ministry, we'd come back. And the bush burned. And the purposes that God have for you, sometimes you have to be in a wilderness before you really get the perspective. You know, before Moses was in the wilderness, it was all about, I can do this and I can do that. And, and then God comes in, the fire burns, and he says, God, I can't even speak. Uh, <laughs> well, we know from the book of Acts that prior to this, he was a man mighty in word and deed, learned in all the learning of the Egyptians, a powerful prince of Egypt. But his self-confidence had been so shaken. He said, God, I, I can't even talk. you got to send someone as my mouthpiece. Well, maybe that wasn't the right idea either, 100%. But he'd learned that it has to be God. And it has to be done God's way. And you can't do things in the flesh and expect a spiritual result. So the wilderness is a place of meeting with God and receiving direction, and God reignited the calling that was upon his life, even though he had failed. The, the, the wilderness is often a place where God gives you a second chance because you know it has to be him in a deeper level than you've ever known before. The wilderness is a place where we find that he is the God who sees Hagar was out in the wilderness in Genesis 16, 6. She'd been driven away with her child from Sarai into the wilderness. She didn't know what was going to happen. Genesis 16, Abraham said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. By the way, we say that a lot when we're in the wilderness. Shur. (laughs) He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress, submit to her authority. Gave her some other promises about this son that would be born named Ishmael. And you know, it's a good thing to ask ourselves when we're in a wilderness. Where have we come from? And where are we going? We've come from a history of seeing God's faithfulness in our lives. That's where we've come from. We may have hit a few landmines along the way, But essentially in our lives, we have a history of having seen God's faithfulness. That's where we've come from. Where are we going? We're going to continue to see his faithfulness. That's where we're going. We're going to continue to see him work in our lives. Even though we've been in the wilderness and things have happened that that we wish hadn't have happened, as in our home and maybe your own, this is where we've come from and this is where we're going. We're going on to see God's honor revealed in the world and to hold up what Christ has done for humanity in his crucifixion, his ability to change a life. That's where we're going. And sometimes we just have to ask ourselves that, that same question, and don't say, sure. (laughs) Where have you come from? Where are you going? And then we get some direction. The wilderness is a place where we learn a new dependence upon God. We've had a dependence upon God. But in the wilderness, you learn it in a deeper way. 
Song of Solomon, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 5. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? When we come out of the wilderness, leaning on our beloved, we have a new dependency upon him. Less, less about what we can do and more about what he can do. Less about our abilities and more about his ability. Less about our way of following and more about his way of leading. A new dependence, leaning on him. The wilderness is where we find God doing something new. Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Sometimes that new thing is the old thing revived, and sometimes there are literally new things that God does. But what we have to, what, what the enemy doesn't want and what our flesh doesn't want when we're in a wilderness is to have faith and confidence that even though we're in a wilderness, God's up to something. He's up to something. Abraham was in a wilderness. He was in his 90s, and he'd been promised descendants. He hadn't had them. He'd tried his own way through manipulating circumstances to get a dependent. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4 that he looked at his own body, now as good as dead. See, when you're in the wilderness, you're looking at what you can do, and sometimes it just seems dead. We don't know what to do. But the Bible says that Abraham could look at his own body, impossible for him to father children at that age in the natural order of things, completely impossible, completely impossible for his wife to bear a child at her age. Those of you who knew my mom, we had her pegged to be Sarah in a play. <laughs> when she was in her 80s, <laughs> she ended up with a backache and she couldn't do it, but she was going to pretend like she was giving birth, you know, in, in this play that we had. That would have been priceless, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but, I mean, that's the idea. He looked at his own body, now as good as dead, but grew strong in his faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to accomplish. See, it's in the wilderness that you make decisions to continue to honor the Lord and to put him first. It's in the wilderness where we find that God is doing something new, even if it's the old thing that's been renewed within us. He's, there's something fresh that he wants to bring out and come. And it's through the sufferings that we go through in our lives that makes us relatable to others who've gone through different things, who maybe don't have the Lord and don't know how to reach out to him. But you can reach out to them and take them by the hand and lift them up and put their hand in his hand because you know where they've been and you have felt what they have felt and you have had your heart broken like they have had their heart broken. It's when you've been through the wilderness that you're relevant to hurting people. None of us would choose to be hurting. But the truth is, God uses these things to make us relevant in other people's lives in ways that we could not possibly be if we had not gone through our own wilderness experience. There's something fresh and something new that God wants to do. And the enemy just wants us to believe that everything is hopeless, everything is bleak, that, that you know, God's not in charge, that, that you know, something has changed. And uh, no, you've got to stop yourself. I, no, no, no. Where have you come from? I've come from a long lineage of seeing God faithful. Where are you going? I'm going to continue in that lineage. And I'm going to trust him. Even if my heart is broken over the circumstances that have happened, I'm going to trust him. 
because he alone knows the end from the beginning and he alone knows everything I don't know. That's real on a daily basis in our home because we have a wilderness situation that's every day with us. But I found him faithful, and I know I will. And I know that I don't know the future, but I know he does. And I know there's a reason that things happen the way they do. And he doesn't always tell us that reason. But I know there's no other way to live. And I know there's no one else to follow. And I know that he is the roadway out of the wilderness. And I know that the wilderness, it might be great in terms of being expansive, but it will come to an end. And there will be a new day. There will be a better situation. Because I know he's faithful. Where have you come from? Where are you going? Don't wander. Be purposeful. They said we can't go and do what God wants us to do. And that's why they wandered for 40 years. The spies came back after 40 days. There's giants in the land. We're grasshoppers in their sight. I doubt if they were that big of giants. <laughs> They'd have been like as tall as, you know, the steel building or something like that. So God said, okay. And then for every day, you got a year of wandering for every day that you spied out the land. Forty years. I don't want to wander. You know, we, we get one shot at this life. One shot. And there are things that we have to overcome. In our home, there are things that we have to overcome on a daily basis. But our confidence is in the Lord. And I know yours is too. And I don't want to wander. It's easy to feel like you want to wander. <laughs> Isn't it? It's easy to let emotions drive us. And sometimes I do. I get depressed over what happens to my daughter. And I have to fight it. And that's there every day. And I have to choose not to wander in that depression. I have to choose to put my confidence in the Lord on a daily basis. And when I do, I always find him faithful. I don't know if I'm shocking you or not, but I'm just telling you the way it is. It's true. And if I'm shocking you, you cut me, I bleed. You know? <laughs> Pastors aren't some superhuman thing that you know, doesn't know what it's like to live a life where we have problems. But I do know this, too, that we're supposed to be a voice in the wilderness, bringing clarity. John 1, 23, he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, John the Baptist, as Isaiah the prophet said. And when you get your clarity in the wilderness, you can help others who are stuck in the wilderness to get their clarity. You find the way ahead in God. And that, that way ahead is just through trusting him in childlike faith. That, that's the way ahead. God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to continue to do the little things in my life to put you first and to keep you in the position that you're in. And I'm going to trust you that even though I don't see a road, you're going to help me make a road out of this wilderness. 
and you're gonna use me as a voice to bring clarity to others in the wilderness. Trust God. He's got you. You may not understand, but he does. And things happen the way they do for a reason, even if we don't know what that reason is. They happen for a reason. And we have to trust him and love him. And the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And when we stop keeping the main thing the main thing and we, we put other issues or disappointments or, and I, believe me, I'm talking to myself here too. In the place that's reserved for God, that's when we wander in the wilderness. That's when I wander in it. But I'm so thankful that God's word brings a clarity to our lives. Do we really believe that he causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose? Is he in the wilderness? You have to answer that. Do I really believe this? And you must believe it because it's what God's word tells us. Well, I don't know how you're going to do it. Well, we don't know how he created the universe by speaking either, but he did it. We don't have to know how. We just have to have our heart following him, refusing to be offended, refusing to succumb to all the negative emotions that life can bring our way. Oh, yeah, we can be there, but we don't have to stay there. Refusing. God, there, there's a, a roadway I'm going to build out of this wilderness. And, and here's a, a big brick that I'm going to put down. Here's a patch of asphalt I'm going to put down there. You said in your word that you cause all things to work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. I'm getting out of this wilderness. Here's another one. The angel of the Lord encamps around about those who fear him to deliver him. Here's a, another piece I'm going to put in that road. You know, you can just keep going on and on. I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good and not for evil. Plans for blessing, not for calamity. Plans with the future and a hope. God, I'm going to put this in place. I'm getting out of this wilderness. And I'm going to be a voice to those who are in it, come this way. Come this way. Come to him. Come out of that wilderness leaning on your beloved. Not angry at him. Leaning on him. Come out of this wilderness having been humbled, but knowing that he alone holds everything in his hands. Knowing that there's a, a realm of the Holy Spirit, righteousness, peace, and joy, that is the kingdom of God that, that he's going to bring us back to in spite of the wilderness that we've been in. The joy of the Lord is our strength. How about that one for a good one? good chunk of that road. The joy of the Lord is my strength. My flagship scriptures from Philippians chapter 4. Be anxious for nothing. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. He had to say it twice. Why do you think they had to say it twice? They didn't respond the first time, so he says it again. Don't freak out. <laughs> Let your gentleness be, known, be made known to all men. Let your request be made known to God. The Lord is near. And the peace of God that doesn't make any sense at all will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. You see, when I'm in the wilderness, I contend for that because it's real. And even though our circumstances haven't changed at this point. My heart changes. And my relationship with God becomes so strong. 
You know, Jesus was called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He's been in your shoes. He knows what it's like. And he sends his comforter to our lives when we're in a place to receive what the Holy Spirit wants to bring and wants to do. He comes. And I know that even though we have extremely difficult circumstances in our family, I'm a child of God. And he loves me, and he loves our daughter. And he's the only one who really understands the reasons things are the way they are. And he's the only one who knows what they're going to be tomorrow. And he says, trust me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he shall bring it to pass. I'm going to ask Ed to come up to the front. I'd like for us to pray together. And if you're here in this room or if you're now watching online, thanks to our amazing and awesome technology team here who got us back going here today, I want you to pray along with me. And the first thing I'd like to pray is if you're here and you've never prayed to give your life to Jesus, or if you're watching online and you don't know that Christ is your Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And then tell us, Dear Lord God, I come to you today. I have sinned and made mistakes in my life. This morning, I ask you to forgive me. I give my life to you. I'm willing to change my ways. I ask you to be my Lord, my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me, Lord. I give you control of my life. I entrust myself to you. Jesus, you died and rose again to meet my need. And I thank you for that. I give myself to you today. And for others who, like me, you've been in the wilderness, I just want to tell you, you'll find him faithful. And let's pray together. Dear Lord God, it's been a tough year, a confusing year, a painful year. But I thank you that you are my God. I thank you that I've come from a history of knowing you, a history of seeing you faithfully move and act. And where am I going? I'm going into more of the same because I refuse to let this wilderness convince me that you're not in charge, that you don't have a good plan, that you're not the Lord who loves me. And I thank you. I just ask the Holy Spirit to come with a burning bush and ignite something fresh in my life today like you did with Moses when he failed in the natural. You showed him you're the God of the second chance. You're the God who sees in the wilderness. You're the God who makes a way. And I give myself to you. Help me to put your scriptures in that roadway out of this wilderness like Jesus did when he overcame the temptation and the tempter in the wilderness. 
Lord, there's nothing else really worth living for than you. And I just re-surrender myself to you today. And I thank you for the cleansing and the renewing, Lord. There's something new that you do in the wilderness. The new thing. Wash away all that we've picked up in the wilderness to a fresh and a new day. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.